I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Today, we're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. And as I mentioned before, God uses men to deliver His Word, just like an artist would use different pens or brushes. And sometimes you want a magic marker. Other times you're going to want a fountain pen whenever you're writing. Sometimes you paint with a fine brush and watercolors. And other times you're going to use a palette knife or oil paint. And so when we look at the 66 books of the Bible, all written by men who lived hundreds or even thousands of years apart from each other, while their styles or their narratives may differ slightly, they still complement each other. And yet they never contradict each other. Let's consider how Mark's account of the gospel may differ slightly and yet complement even Matthew's gospel, which we just read over the last several chapters. So let's read starting in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 begins in this way. In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. Now, Matthew's gospel was the most Jewish of the gospel, and that's the way I described it several weeks ago when we began in Matthew chapter 1. And in its primary emphasis and its audience, obviously Mark was trying to communicate mostly to the Jewish people. Mark chooses to focus on Jesus in a different way, not as the long-awaited Messiah, although he does mention these things, but he focuses on Jesus as the suffering servant. Now, Matthew began his gospel with messianic titles like son of David and son of Abraham. But Mark begins with son of God. And in the Old Testament, the term son of God is used several times. It describes people other than the Messiah. A nation of Israel at one point is called God's firstborn son. The Psalms refer to David and Solomon both as son of God. David is referred to as a begotten son on the day that David was made king. And angels and pious men and kings of Israel are all called sons of God. But there is something odd about that title when it comes to the Messiah. And that's because God does not have a wife, that he would produce offspring. So the title son of God is referring to the Messiah And it must have a different meaning than is normally ascribed in our culture to someone who is called a son. And I have heard people argue, for instance, that God was a coward. And so why does he send his son down to die instead of dying for us himself? And that notion is just purely ignorant of the fact that Jesus is God made flesh. Consider what the Bible says in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was both with God, and He was God. John chapter 1, verse 2 says, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And look, it goes on here in John 1, verse 14, And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, because Jesus came in the flesh, men did not behold his heavenly glory. And you know, the Messiah's earthly glory was more like a son of men. Jesus was fully God and yet fully man. And the glory that the apostles beheld was Jesus's earthly glory. Only on the Mount of Transfiguration did three of Jesus' disciples behold a glimpse of Jesus' heavenly glory. And we catch a glimpse of that here in Matthew 17, verses 1 through 8. He says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. That is, he took on a different appearance. The Bible says his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Now, after the Last Supper, Jesus prayed in the company of his disciples and he spoke of the glory that he had with the Father before the world even was. Look at what it says in John chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. He says, I have glorified you on the earth. 
and I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, and listen, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, the Jewish prophet Micah also speaks of the deity of the Messiah. And look at what it says in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, yet shall come out from you forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from antiquity, from eternity. So, The title Son of God is specifically referring to the eternal person of the Trinity who came in the flesh, and he's known as the Messiah, Jesus. Son of God is not to be confused with an actual offspring of God. Oh, God has a little boy. Rather, that term is for us, like the Son of Man, in order to help us to better comprehend Jesus in the flesh and then to distinguish between when the Messiah, as a person of the Trinity, is ministering from when God the Judge, or a.k.a. God the Father, is ministering. And it helps us to distinguish when God, who exists in three persons, is operating as Messiah, and when He transitions to operate as Judge, or when He is operating as God the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says here in Malachi chapter 1, verse 3. It says, it is written in the prophets. He says, see, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear his way before me. And then he says, he will clear his way before me. And then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger that you desire, that is the messenger of the covenant that you desire. See, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Let's read here, once again, beginning in Mark chapter 1. He says, In the beginning, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We understand this term now. Verse 2, he says, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I am sending my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. Like I said, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, he's saying, see, I'm sending that messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And obviously, this is setting up John the Baptist. Look at what it says in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. He says, look, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I would come and strike the land with a curse. So he's talking about sending this one who will come before the Messiah, that he will not be Elijah himself, but rather he will be one who operates in the spirit and with the similar message of Elijah. And his job is to turn the hearts of the children back to their fathers, to turn the hearts of the fathers back to their Children, you see, the message of John the Baptist, whom this is describing, who preached a baptism of repentance, it was not unlike my message to you, right? And what is my message to you? To return to the word of the Lord and to walk according to the word of the Lord. Now, John came to plead with God's people, not just to be baptized with water, but at their moment of humble immersion, right, when they're, when they're submitting themselves to be baptized, that that would become a movement toward righteousness, the willingness to repent and then to demonstrate that repentance. It would be a return to the word of the Lord. And it was the only hope for revival. So repenting and seeking God's word would restore that father and child relationship. Now, how would it do that? Because it restores biblical values. If you have fathers who are willing to turn from their sin and turn back to the word of the Lord, well, then they're going to seek it, they're going to obey it, and then they're going to talk about it everywhere they go. And eventually they will be able to comprehensively teach it to their children and to talk about it to anybody. And so 
when John the Baptist comes and he's restoring people to repentance and then seeking God's word, that begins to restore the father and the child relationship. And then when a child grows up in a home where the biblical values rule the house, well, then those are your values that you grow up with. And, and that's how you live according to the word of the Lord. That's how the values of the Bible are passed down from generation to generation. Okay, that's how you restore biblical values. By the way, that's how you do it in our day, too. And that's why we're in the Word. So few people have ever read the Bible. Only 11% of Americans have ever read the Bible cover to cover. That's 89% of Americans. And yet our money says, in God we trust. And yet we don't even trust Him to go to His Word every day. I'm glad you're doing it. Look at what it says here in Psalm 78. It describes the situation which the Lord prescribes for fathers and children and for the culture to operate as. It says in Psalm 78, verses 5 through 8, he says, For he established a testimony in Jacob, and he appointed a law in Israel. That word law in Hebrew is Torah. And Torah does not mean law. It means a teaching. So he appointed a teaching in Israel. Now you understand the next verse, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that they should teach them to their children so that the generation to come might know them, right? The children who would be born, that they might arise and declare them to their children. And he goes on to say that they might set their hope in God, speaking of this generation to come and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And then he goes on to finish and says, and they might not be like their fathers, a stubborn and a rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Well, that describes not only the culture right before Jesus came onto the scene, a rebellious generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. But that also describes our generation, doesn't it? So now here we are with biblical values restored. Then the people could perceive, they could perceive that Jesus is the Messiah and they could understand the purpose of his ministry along with their responsibility to surrender to him. You see, John's own father that is John the Baptist, he had prophesied of this very thing. Look at what it says here in Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 17. It says, But the angel said to John's father, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. He goes on to say, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, that is, he'll be one who is set apart. And he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit. I've heard a lot of preachers say, you know, before Jesus resurrected from the grave in Acts chapter 2, people were not filled with the Holy Spirit. I think there's plenty of situations in the Old Testament which say that that's probably not correct, that there were people who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's one of those instances. He says he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. It continues and says, and he will also go on before him, that is the Messiah, in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, meaning those who are unrepentant to turn them back to walking according to the word of the Lord, in order to make a people prepared for the Lord. Now, Psalm 78, uh, I'm sorry, Psalm 85 Verse 13 says, righteousness will go before him and prepare the way for his steps. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 14. uh, This is Jesus speaking. He says, uh, if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah to come. Speaking uh, Speaking of John the Baptist. 
So now here, let's move on from where we were. So verse 4 picks up in Mark chapter 1. It picks up the narrative, and he says, John came baptizing in the wilderness. Okay, John became, came baptizing in the wilderness, and he was preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Verse 5, And then all of the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him. Now think about that. You can underline that in your Bible. All were baptized by John in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. It is exactly what was prophesied would happen. He was baptizing in the Jordan. Now look at what it says, baptizing in the Jordan. Now check this out. John's account of where John the Baptist was. Now I'm not, the Apostle John is a different guy from John the Baptist. And so the Apostle John's account of where John the Baptist was, uh, was baptizing is more of a GPS, right? And here's what he said. Not just baptizing them in the Jordan River, but John 1 verse 28 says this, and all this happened in Bethany. So, okay, we know it's in Bethany because, you know, the Jordan River goes all the way through. It goes all the way through the land of Israel. So all this happened in Bethany across the Jordan, or as they say, the region beyond the Jordan, okay, where John was baptizing. You say, Steve, why is it important that I know that? Well, because John was baptizing across the Jordan, the symbolism was even deeper than I think most people understand. It's not enough to just go to the edge of Israel and to be baptized in the water of the Jordan as a humble uh, display uh, of wanting to return to the Lord. That's easy to do. But in order to go to the region beyond the Jordan, you literally have to leave Israel. Today, it would be modern-day Jordan, the nation of modern-day Jordan. You had to go across the Jordan. You had to leave Israel. And the symbolism is this. It's as if the people's sins were as heinous as the generation of the Babylonian exiles. You see, they were exiled in the history of Israel because of their sins against the Lord. And finally, the Lord says, okay, you're put in time out. You have to leave the land of Israel. So to come out and to say, I want to be baptized, and then I want to be immersed in the word of the Lord, the display of that was, okay, well, now prove it. Would you be willing to actually literally leave Israel as a display of your humility and your confession of sin? And then repent on on the outside of Israel so that you could be returned to the word of the Lord. It was a huge admission for anyone going out there of how great their sin was. And then once you're repaired to the Lord, you get to return to Israel, humbled uh, as repentant exiles who had returned to the Lord. And you know, it's one thing to display outward signs of worship, but it's another thing to surrender inwardly so even the religious leaders were going out there because, oh, this is easy. This is simple. This is all I have to do. Go down to the desert, cross the Jordan River. All Everybody's there. They get to see, oh, look, our rabbi, he's so humble. Watch what he's also doing it. It's one thing to go out there and to be baptized as a public sign so everybody can see you. You know, your reputation is the part of your life that everybody sees. Everybody sees your reputation. Your character is the part of who you are that sometimes only the Lord sees or maybe just a few people that are close to you. And John's going to address that in just a moment. But let's look at his wardrobe. What was he wearing? It says in verse 6, Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. What does this tell us? This tells us that he's clothed in ha uh, camel's hair. He's got the leather belt. Well, that's Elijah's uniform. So not only is he coming in the message and in the spirit of Elijah, repent, our judgment is near, but he's even wearing Elijah's types of clothes. He's wearing Elijah's uniform. Now check this out from the Old Testament, 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. 
says this, and then he said to them, that is a king who was asking about a man whom his uh, soldiers had met up with. He says, and then he said to them, what kind of a man was it who came up to you to meet you and who told you these words? And 2 Kings uh, 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 chapter 1, verse 8 says this, so they answered him and they said, he was a hairy man and he was wearing a leather belt around his waist. And the king said, ah, oh, that's Elijah the Tishbite. Isn't it interesting? Now, not only is he coming in the spirit of Elijah, but John the Baptist is literally wearing the uniform so that nobody should have any doubt. The spirit which he's coming in and the fulfillment of the prophecy, not only that the Old Testament prophets had prophesied, but even his own father had prophesied before he was even born. It says he ate locusts and wild honey. You know, although it's argued, some pastors, I've heard pastors say, well, you know, it's unkosher to eat locust. Um, it's actually an ignorant, now when I say ignorant, I don't mean stupid, I just mean they just, they're just, uh, they either don't know or they're ignoring the truth of the word. Uh, locusts were kosher to eat, and John was eating biblically. Look at what it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 19. He says, all winged insects are unclean for you, and they may not be eaten. And that's where I think a lot of pastors are saying, you know, he was, he was out there and he wasn't even eating kosher food. But hold on, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 21 says this, but you may eat these kinds of winged insects that walk on all fours and that have jointed legs above their feet for hopping on the ground. Well, that sounds a lot like an insect to me that's called a locust, and that's exactly what he was eating. And obviously wild honey is, uh, is nothing, that, uh, nothing that would be against the Jewish dietary laws to eat. What I like about the fact that he's wearing a leather belt and he's wearing camel's hair and he's eating insects and he's eating wild honey is this. This guy was on nobody's payroll, right? He... He gets to do what he wants to do the way he wants to do it. He has no boss to tell him, do you understand if you do that, you'll upset the reputation of this organization? No, he just gets to do what the Lord calls him to do. And he's on nobody's payroll. Nobody can say, if you don't be quiet, we're going to stop paying you. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm picking up locusts off the ground and eating them. I'm, the, the honey that I get, I'm not buying in a store. I'm getting wild honey. This camel's hair, which I'm wearing right now, this camel's, you know, leather with still got the camel's hair on it and the leather belt. All of these things which the Lord provides for me naturally. And to me, that alone should be an encouragement for many of us to just simply do what the Lord says and to trust Him to provide for you, even though you may find great opposition. You know, Groundworks Ministries is that type of a ministry. I mean, I don't have an industry where I'm selling t-shirts or I have a product that I'm selling. I'm literally living on the Lord prompting the hearts of people to go to Groundworks Ministries slash support and support the ongoing work of teaching the word of the Lord. And so you're not my provider. The Lord is my provider, although he may stir up your heart to say, hey, you know what? You should participate financially in the discipleship which is happening through Groundworks Ministries. And I hope that he does. But just know that we're living on locust and wild honey over here. <laughs> And we're not, we're not going to stop it. And, uh, and I think that's a, that is a good, uh, that's a good situation for us right now. Now, the Bible says, uh, Luke's gospel adds, uh, well, let me keep reading. Verse 7, he says, and uh, he says, and John preached the gospel. Hold on, I'm having a problem with my camera here. He says, and John came... Uh, I'm sorry, verse 6, he says, Now John was clothed in camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Now verse 7, And he preached, saying, There is one who comes after me who was mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and to loose. Verse 8, he says, I, need, I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, that's interesting. Uh, Luke's gospel adds that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. 
Consider this in Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. He says, Now uh, the people were waiting expectantly, and all of them were debating in their minds whether John himself might be the Messiah. And John answered and said to them all, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is more powerful than I. And I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And his winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat of his barn. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. Uh, That's pretty amazing. You know, that same fire from the Lord can heal people, and the same fire can also destroy people at the very same time. Now consider this from Acts chapter 2. He says, And when the day of Pentecost had arrived, there were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. He says, And tongues like flames of fire were divided, and they appeared to them, and they rested on each of them. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to speech, uh, to speak. And so on the day of Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church there, fire came and rested upon those apostles who were standing there. And yet they were not consumed. But look at what we see here in Revelation chapter 11, verses uh, 3 and 5. 3 through 5, he says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees, speaking of a biblical symbol, uh, which was earlier, and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if, he said, and if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, well, then he must be killed in this manner. So we see that the fire of the Spirit of God can rest upon a believer and it will empower them and it will not consume them. But on unbelief and on rebellion, the very same fire can even flow from the believer toward the unbeliever, and then the very same fire which empowers and informs can also destroy. And I don't know about you, but if I get a chance uh, to, to be on the side of the Lord or to be on the side or the recipient of destroying fire, I think I would turn from my sin and turn to the Lord. Amen. Mark chapter 1 verse 9 continues. It says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came up from Nazareth of Galilee, and he was baptized in the water uh, uh, by John in the Jordan. So Jesus was baptized. Now let's think of the, the greater symbolism here. Jesus has no sin to confess that he has to go into exile and then confess his sin, and then to come back. Now, why do we know that he has no sin to confess? Well, because 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 is very clear. For God made him, the Messiah, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin, or the sin offering for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus knew no sin, and yet, and yet he went out to the Jordan, and he crossed over into the land beyond the Jordan, which all of the people were doing symbolically in order to confess their sin, and yet he had no sin to confess, okay? Uh, It's it's pretty amazing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He knew no sin, and yet he became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus is baptized in the flesh. And in his flesh, Jesus would eventually pay for the sin debt of not just Israel, but also the entire world, and all for us, so that we might live in His righteousness. Let's keep reading in Mark chapter 1, verse 10. 
Mark chapter 1, verse 10, it says, And immediately coming up from the water, Jesus saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You have the Father's voice. The Spirit is now represented as a dove, and you have the Son standing there in the water. What you have are all three persons of the Trinity, all three present, all independently working at the same time. You see, there is a, there is a, uh, a type of theology, and I, I, I think it's a stretch to even call it a biblical theology, although I understand the idea behind it, called a oneness Pentecostalism, where they said that God only exists as one. They don't believe in the Trinity. They believe that the one functions in a mode where he'll go from being the father in one mode, and then he'll do a costume change and come out as the son, and then he'll do a costume change and come out as the Holy Spirit. And he can do it really fast, but, but he's never kind of at the same time. And you can't really have that type of a theology and then look at passages like this, where all three of them are together. All three of them are doing and acting and speaking independently at the same time. It's not like the guy with the ventriloquist dummy where it's like, you know, the dummy never talks while the guy's drinking a glass of water, right? That's the, that's the whole point because it's really the guy speaking through the dummy. No, God exists in three persons. Father is speaking. Jesus, the son is coming up out of the water and the spirit is descending at exactly the same time. All three persons of the Trinity acting independently, and all three of them are present at the same time. Mark chapter 1, verse 12 continues. And immediately the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. You know, the Holy Spirit will sometimes drive you into uncomfortable naturally dangerous or even demonically life-threatening situations. You say, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe that God would ever do that. I only think that bad things happen to bad people. And if bad things are happening, well, then it must be sin in their life. But hold on. I grew up in the South in what they call Tornado Alley, right where Oklahoma ends and Arkansas begins. And then the tornadoes are just rolling through Texas and Oklahoma and they're all hurtling toward, you know, Arkansas. And I've seen one tornado take out the houses of non-believers and also take out the houses of believers. Coronavirus sweeping through. It's not like, oh, well, you know, only sinners are getting coronavirus. No, the Holy Spirit will sometimes even drive you into uncomfortable or naturally dangerous situations, even demonically life-threatening situations. I mean, do we not remember Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Never forget that you're not alone. That both angels and the Lord himself are with you, even in that valley of the shadow of death. Consider this from Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. He says, and do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Let's keep reading here now in Mark chapter 1, verse 14. He says, and now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. He was preaching the gospel. Now, today, if we think of the gospel, we think of Jesus died for our sins. He rose from the grave and he's alive and he offers salvation to anyone who would turn from their sin and receive it. But the gospel at the core simply means the good news. And the good news at that time was that the God who makes promises keeps his promises. He's preaching the gospel, okay? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is right here among us. Repent and believe in the gospel. 
You see, the Messiah gave a choice. His choice is to atone for sin. And he makes the first choice. He chose us and that he would die for us. But we also have a choice. We have a responsibility to faithfully choose to turn from our sin. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 23 says, Repent therefore and be converted, that is, be changed, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the, from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, that is, that Jesus, who was preached to you, that he died for your sins and rose again, he was also preached that he would come back and receive you. It says here in verse 21 of Acts chapter 3, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, and him you shall hear in all things. Whatever he says to you, And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Even here in Luke chapter 5, verse 32, he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And this is the good news which he was preaching. The Messiah is here. He is standing before you. And Jesus says, and by the way, He is me, and I'm going to demonstrate that through miraculous things so that you will know who I am. If you had listened to John and truly repented and returned to the word of the Lord, then you'll understand that all of those holy prophets were talking about me. And when you see me, you will see me having read what I should look like and what I should do. And, and, and how I was going to work in miraculous ways, and then you'll be able to recognize that I am the Messiah. You see, people weren't saved simply by repenting from their sin. The repenting from your sin and returning to the word of the Lord in that day is to prepare you to see the one who will eventually take away your sin from you and atone for your sin. But if you don't turn to the word of the Lord and you don't truly repent in your heart, how in the world could you see him, even though he's standing right in front of you? Mark chapter 1, verse 16. And as Jesus walked by the sea of the Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets, and they followed him. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, and they were mending their nets. Verse 20, and immediately Jesus called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and they went after Jesus. Now, fishers of men, there's a better narrative, it's a fuller narrative in Luke chapter 5, and when we get there, we'll discuss those things, Uh, and it won't be long, because we're, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, so in a few weeks, we'll be there, we'll discuss those things at, uh, at length, but Jesus is redeeming an Old Testament man fishing imagery. And when we read the Old Testament, we realize that the concept of fishing for men uh, was negative. And Jesus is turning it around to be a positive. Fishing for men in the Old Testament was the result of people having turned from the Lord, and therefore he would send men to fish for them, but in order to destroy them. Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 16, he says this, I'm about to send for many fishermen because of the sin of the people. This is the Lord's declaration, and they will fish for them, meaning the people of Israel. And I will send for many hunters, and they will hunt them down on every mountain and every hill out of the clefts of the rocks. 
Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 14. You have made mankind like the fish of the sea, like the marine creatures that have no ruler. And that's exactly how Israel had been acting, unruly. They wanted to claim to be the people of God. Hey, we're Jewish, so obviously we have a covenant. And, uh, you know, they had misunderstood the covenant and, and the responsibilities of being the, the people of God. And they just assumed that God would never judge them so they could do what they wanted to do. We have no ruler. And yet we're going to expect for him to bless us. And this is what happens when people only seek parts of the Bible or somebody spoon feeds them uh, wrong ideas, and then they say, well, I have to trust him because he's been to seminary. Hey, you should read the Bible for yourself, which is exactly what we're doing, so we can know what the Bible truly says, so that when you say amen to somebody preaching, it's amen according to the word of the Lord. And when, or, or maybe you hear somebody say something that in past you would have said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea, and then you find out, no, that's not scriptural at all. And then you can stand up and say, hey, you shouldn't be preaching that. Well, where's that kind of boldness? I don't know, but 89% of the Christians, or at least of the Americans, have never read the Bible cover to cover. And perhaps that's why you don't have the faithful boldness, because you don't have the faithful, simple pursuit of the word of the Lord. But I digress. Mark chapter 1, verse 21 says, And they went their way into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught them. You know, it's not astonishing that Jesus was allowed to teach, even on his first visit to the synagogue. Because the synagogue was not like a church as we know it. Teaching was not as much sermonizing as we see when we go to a church, as much as it was a discussion about the Bible. And the purpose of meeting at the synagogue, by the way, was that everyone is learning the Bible. It's not just to hear this person's sermon and to sit quietly, but if you had a question in the middle of the talking through the Bible, you could have that answer, you could have that answered. And and it's, it's not just that we want to hear what one guy has to say about the Bible. So everyone was allowed to speak. Question and answers were just simply part of the Jewish culture because they're like, hey, our purpose here is to know the Bible. But can you imagine going to the average church right? In the middle of a sermon, you raise your hand, you say, I'm sorry, could you, could you circle back and clarify what you just said? I, uh, me and my wife are, and some people around us don't quite understand exactly where it was that, that you're going with this. I mean, you'd be run out of that church. And yet it was not, uh, it was not uncommon for even a stranger who's a Jewish person on the Sabbath to walk into a synagogue, even if they're visiting, and to stand up and to to make a a comment or a statement about the the scripture that was being made there. And we see that happen in the, in the new Testament, in the epistles all the time, where Paul will walk into a synagogue and start teaching. And, And if you understand the culture, you understand how that was happening. It's really hard to understand that within the context of a modern church service where all the focus is on one guy. And if anybody disturbs that moment, even for the sake of clarifying what the Bible says, Uh, typically they would be asked to either be quiet or if it continued, they typically are asked to leave. Mark chapter 1 verse 22 goes on to say, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, again, authority means ordination. Okay, Scribes, is an unordained seminary student. So when they say he teaches like he has authority, it's like it teaches like he has is a pastor with a PhD and he has an ordination. He's not teaching like these scribes that they keep sending up here from Jerusalem who are really just student preachers who don't have the ability to make interpretations and, and they don't have the authority in order to even say anything that would contradict the rabbi who they're learning under. And they said, Jesus teaches like he has an ordination and yet we don't know anybody, any seminary, any yeshiva which he went to which gave him an ordination. But he's definitely not talking like these student pastors which are coming up here from Jerusalem. Consider what it says in John chapter 12, verse 50. John chapter 12, verse 50 says this, For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command. Right? 
Tell me by what authority that you say these things. The Lord has given me a command as to what I should say and what I should speak. Remember Psalm 78, the Lord has commanded a law or a teaching in Israel, and he commands the fathers to teach this to their children. Remember Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7. This word which I'm giving you today is to be on your heart. Teach it diligently to your children and then talk about it basically everywhere that you go. So what is he saying? He's saying, hey, listen, it's not just that I have been given an ordination to be a pastor by my father. Every Jewish man should be able to not only know and seek the Bible, but also be able to speak authoritatively upon it. What do you mean by what authority do I have this? Every Jewish man should be able to seek the word of the Lord and talk about it. Consider this from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel said this, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, see, he's seeing the Messiah in a prophecy, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days, we think of him as God the Father, and they brought him near before him, and then to the Messiah, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all of the peoples, all of the nations and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. That's how we know that it's not some man who was trucked up to the Lord, but that the, that the prophet was literally seeing the Messiah. Why? Because the dominion which was given to him is everlasting, which should not pass away. And his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed, right? And you can even read it here on the screen. He's speaking and he's talking about the Messiah. And all of the holy prophets saw this. And when they prophesied, they prophesied from this messianic context. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 13 and 14. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or as his counselor taught him, no, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to teach the word of the Lord. It's not our job to teach the Spirit. Oh, no, you don't understand. Our culture today, the Bible, nobody will receive it. No, the Holy Spirit says this is the truth. It is the word. It never fades and it never passes away. It's relevant in every generation, but not every generation will receive it in mass. Isaiah 40, verse 14. With whom did the Holy Spirit take counsel? And who instructed him, right? Who taught him in the paths of justice? And, and, and who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? You see, this is Jesus, one of the Trinity. And they're like, where do you get this authority? And how can you say these things? 1 John chapter 2, verses 26 and 27, speaking of the Holy Spirit, the one whom he says, hey, who taught the Holy Spirit? No, it's the Holy Spirit's job to teach us. Look at what it says. 1 John 2, verse 26 and 27, he says, These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. That is, those who might have a seminary degree, or they may have an ordination from a particular denomination, and yet they're not speaking according to the word of the Lord. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him, the Holy Spirit. See, if you're not a believer, you don't have the Holy Spirit, even though you might have an ordination even though you might be running a church. He says, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. He doesn't leave you. And you don't need that anyone teach you. That's why we're setting up daily appointments between you and the Holy Spirit in the word of the Lord every day. He says, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in in him. Let's continue reading here in Mark uh, chapter 21. He says, And then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue, synagogue and he taught. Now we know how it is he could do this. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And now verse 23 he says, Now there was a certain man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit a demon. And it says, and he cried out saying, uh, he, and he cried out saying, let us alone. One man speaking. And yet he says, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus 
of Nazareth. You see, the demons know who he is. The Bible says that the demons believe in what? Tremble. They're not saved, and yet they know who Jesus is. He says, did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Verse 25, Jesus rebuked the demon, saying, quiet and come out of him. You know what Jesus never does? And we see the same thing happening with the apostles as we move you know, beyond the Gospels. Jesus never allows a demon to testify as to who Jesus is. Okay? He never lets a demon tell people who Jesus is. He shuts them up immediately. Okay? Never go to non-believers. I was just speaking with a guy last night. And he says, yeah, I'm hanging out with these people and they're really into this messianic movement. And you know what? There's a lot about the messianic movement, which is good and it's wonderful. I used to be an assistant rabbi, an associate rabbi at Shuva Yisrael congregation in Irvine, California. Rabbi who was brought up in Brooklyn and then went through bar mitzvah and then he became a believer in the 1970s. He went to Moody Bible Institute. He went to Dallas Theological Seminary. He had really good he had really good theology, and yet they still had the Jewish uh, understanding and the cultural things, and they did Hebrew liturgy and things like that. And I worked for them, and I even taught there, led worship and taught there. But then there's others whom you come across, and, and they're not always so legit, can I say. And sometimes these people are trying to bind people up. You have to wear this. You have to do this. You have to say that. And, 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 and in the end, you end up being more bound up and you don't feel like I have freedom in the Messiah. But never go to non-believers, okay? Never go to non-believers to learn the Bible. And this guy who was talking to me was in the middle of a, of a group of people who call themselves Messianic believers. They're Jewish believers and yet the things which they were reading and the ideas that they were putting forth were not from believers who were Jewish, but they, but they were from non-believing rabbis from, 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 the, from the past. And they're, they're, they're learning from these non-believing rabbis, and they're thinking that they're growing in their faith. But the truth is, these non-believing rabbis are just casting to them more and more disillusionment about the word of the Lord. And these guys are dismantling their faith and their understanding of the Bible. No, don't go to non-believers, either, either non-Messianic Jewish people or secular colleges. I had a friend of mine who went to Harvard and he wanted to go to Harvard Divinity School. And so he came back from Harvard Divinity School and he was very disenchanted. And we're like, well, what's the problem? I mean, you would think Harvard, it's gotta be the best, right? He goes, you know, not a one of my seminary professors at Harvard, <laughs> at Harvard Seminary, not a single one of them were believers. Never go to the world. Don't go to secular colleges to learn the Bible. Don't go to mass media to learn the Bible, right? The History Channel. Did Jesus have a wife? Could they have had a child, right? What about the Gospel of Judas, you know? All this stuff. Don't go to the world to learn the Bible. You have the Holy Spirit and you have a Bible. Read the Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth and the understanding. And he will answer that. And then give me godly community of other people who are also filled with the Holy Spirit and seeking your word. And then together, we will not only grow in knowledge of the Bible and right understanding, but we'll also be properly motivated to go out and to share the gospel through both our works and also through our testimony. You see, non-believers are never going to lead you deeper in the Bible or to a deeper understanding of Jesus. Satan will only use them to cast doubt and to confuse you, to cause division among believers and to drive you away from believing rightly. Read your Bible. <laughs> Stay in close community with Bible-believing Christians instead. And Jesus shut down that testimony. Why? Because he doesn't want the people later to go to a rabbi and to say to them, hey man, that guy's the Messiah. And he says, well, how do you know he's the Messiah? He's like, dude, a demon told me. No, <laughs> no. Satan, his greatest tool 
is to try to tell the truth, but to tell it from a negative perspective. And if you don't believe that's the truth, go back there and read the story of Adam and Eve and a little snake in the garden. And look how he uses the truth to twist it in a negative way in order to dismantle the faith. And that's what he'll do to you. So stay in the word and stay led by the Holy Spirit and community with believers. Look what he says. He says, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of this man. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him, he cried out with a loud voice and he came out of him. You know, the devil and demons do not leave your life quietly. Oh, I am so sorry. They don't clean and dust on their way out. No, they turn over tables and they and they break lamps on their way out of town. But don't worry about that. Let the Lord drive the world's influence out of you. Regardless of how it may convulse you on its way out, it will no longer torment you while it's in. Verse 27, And then they were all amazed, and they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? Well, it's no new doctrine at all. It's in the Bible, if you'd read it. For with authority he commands even, this, even the unclean spirits, and they obey him, and immediately his fame, that is the, the word about who Jesus was and what he was doing, immediately his fame spread throughout the whole region around the Galilee. Verse 29, And now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Verse 30, he says, But Simon's uh, wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her as once. Verse 31, And so Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. So Jesus not only cast out a demon from a guy, but then right as they're leaving church, as it were, as they leave the synagogue, and it's a very short walk. I've been there in Capernaum where they say that Peter's mother-in-law's house was. It's a pretty well-known site where the synagogue was. You're just a few steps away from where the house was. Um, and then his mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law, is sick, and uh, Jesus heals her. And what we learn is that we are saved to serve. Because immediately she serves him. We have this idea in our culture that we're saved so that God will just serve us all the time. And that's not the way it works. We're saved and we're called then, sometimes even into to desperate situations as Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. To show the world that he has power over the temptation, even at what would be our weakest points. We can trust the Lord. Amen? So now we move to Mark chapter 1, verse 32. At the evening, when the sun had set, they brought to Jesus all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. You wonder why they came to him at the evening? Well, it's because the Sabbath had ended. Right? The Sabbath had ended. You say, well, why is that? Well, Jesus starts healing, and the rulers of the synagogue will end up saying to Jesus, hey, you shouldn't heal people on the Sabbath, because that's work. It's like, well, hold on. I'm giving them peace, and I'm giving them rest. How is that not consistent with the Sabbath? But you know what? At this moment, Jesus casts the demon out of a guy, leaves church, goes to his mother-in-law's house, heals her, and then when the Sabbath ended, because the Sabbath ends at sundown, the Jewish Sabbath begins at sundown Friday, and then it ends on sundown Saturday, because the Jewish day begins at sundown. So when the Sabbath had ended, the people of the synagogue are now bringing the demon-possessed and the lame to Jesus. Isn't it amazing how demon oppression of all sorts gets exposed Whenever the word of the Lord shows up, remember John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Whenever the word of the Lord is taught rightly in a church, revival shows up. The spirit of God is now working consistently with the preaching of the word and God shows up. Do you think that there's somebody at the door who was just letting demon-possessed people come into that synagogue on that day, that there would be so many of them at night who got brought to Jesus? No. 
No, because oftentimes you don't see demonic influence in a person's life. It's not like it is on these horror movies all the time. A lot of times just pretty much it's just worldly influence in your life, which is keeping you from the Lord. It doesn't have to make you like a crazy person all the time. It actually, I think most people who are suffering from demonic oppression are people who are just on the outside. They just look like ordinary, successful people. But when the word of the Lord comes in and the Holy Spirit is revealing it, he reveals to you those things in your life that you need to let go. And then when that happens, you have a choice to make. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit who can drive those things out of your life. The word of the Lord has walked into that synagogue and it exposed all types of demonic oppression, not just demonic possession. And that's exactly what happened when Jesus showed up that day. Verse 33, he says, And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And then Jesus healed many who were sick with various diseases. He cast out how many? Many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Why? Once again, he does not want the testimony of who he is to come from the demon. He wants it to come from the Holy Spirit. Verse 35, now in the morning, having risen along, uh, had been risen a long while before daylight, he went out and he departed to a solitary place and there he prayed. Hey, you know what? Go to bed early and get up early and get with the Lord. You say, why should I do it? I would rather pray late at night. Well, you should pray all the time, really, without ceasing. But if you're really going to get up in the, and, and you really want to focus your prayer, Get up in the morning early and start praying. And why is that? Because the time to prepare for the battle is before the battle starts. And that's exactly Jesus' example. Perhaps we should follow that. Verse 36, And Simon and those who were with him were searching for him. Obviously, they had not developed the same habit yet. And they sought him, and they said to him, Hey, everybody's looking for you over here. But Jesus said to him, let's go into the next towns that I might preach the gospel there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. For this purpose I have come forth. You know, Jesus didn't come to plant a church. He came to establish the church, the church at large. I'm sure his people were saying, hey, you know what? I, my mother-in-law lives here, and I fish right down the Sea of Galilee right over there, and this is unbelievable. Let's plant a mega church. Let's start a building program, and we'll put a little thermometer right there up there by the Bema, and then when, when people are teaching, they can see how much money people are giving until we reach our goal. I mean, is that not every church you've ever been in? They're always in a building project. I'm not against building churches. I'm just saying... That Jesus was about establishing the church. He didn't come to put together the first mega church of Capernaum. He came to establish the church at large. Verse 39, he moves on and says, And Jesus was preaching in their synagogues all throughout the Galilee. Now we understand how he can do that. And he was casting out demons. Verse 40, he says, And now a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling down to him, and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Verse 41, And Jesus was moved with compassion, and he stretched out his hand, and he touched him, and he said, I am willing. Here's what I love about that. This leper is worshiping Jesus even before he receives the healing. There's so many people that say, you know, Jesus, I would worship you if you would do this for me, if I could get this job, if I could marry this person, uh, if my kids would do this and such, you know, my daughter gets to make the cheerleading squad. My, if my son will make the quarterback slot, then I'll worship you. No, this guy worships him before the healing and is saying, I'm willing to worship you even if you don't heal me. I'm worshiping you because I know that you have the power to heal me. Do you have that attitude about the Lord or do you still have demands on his performance? Well, I'll worship you if you do this for me. You got to put that behind you because I'll tell you right now, there's a spirit which speaks forth that rubbish, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and he touched the man 
And he says to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and that man was cleansed. And Jesus strictly warned him and he sent him away at once. Verse 44, and Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way and show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. He says, say nothing to anyone. Go to the priest. Offer what Moses prescribed, that is, the Bible. You see, just as Jesus did not want demons testifying as to him being the Messiah, Jesus also wanted the testimony to the priests of a person's freedom from demonic oppression or from disease or from physical impairment. He wanted a person's testimony to be firsthand evidence. He doesn't want the testimony to come from a demon. He doesn't want the testimony to come from a person who saw what happened. He wants the testimony to come directly from the person who was healed. And he also wants things to be done in accordance with God's word, what Moses prescribed. I want everything to be done according to the Bible. Why? Because nothing that I'm doing is going against the Bible. As a matter of fact, everything that I'm saying and everything that I'm doing, even down to the miracles, is clarifying the Bible. It's not replacing it. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. We just read it a few days ago. Do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. That's the Old Testament. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. You see, Jesus' evidence of healing was to be matched with the testimony that Jesus was not operating outside of God's Word. He is the living Word. How could He contradict Himself? And He was restoring true understanding of the truth. Now, you'll hear Him say later, Well, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. And I've heard some pastors wrongly say, Well, Jesus is changing the Bible because he can make the rules and he can change the rules. No, the word of the Lord endures forever. He's not changing the rules. He's correcting the wrong understanding of the rules. He's like, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. He is the living word. He is restoring true understanding of the truth. And now it is free from traditional misinterpretations. Now we move on to Mark chapter 1, verse 45. However, Jesus went out and he began uh, in the, I'm sorry, the man went out and he began to proclaim it freely. He didn't just go to the priest and he didn't do what Jesus said to do. But he went out and he proclaimed it freely. Sometimes even in our own reasoning, We try to do something for the Lord that he not only didn't tell us to do, but sometimes it's something he told us to not do. But then we're just like, no, I got to tell everybody. No, we should learn to obey the word of the Lord as it is, regardless of how we think that we should reason better than what the Bible says. He says, however, this man went out and he began to proclaim what had been done to him freely. And he spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city. But he was outside in deserted places. Well, then did that just kill his ministry? No. And the people came to him from every direction. It says Jesus could no longer openly enter the city. Now, some people come to Jesus with their list of requirements. Right? If you'll do this for me, I'll do this for you. Why have you come to Jesus? I mean, why are you here with us now? Listen to some guy teach the Bible. Why have you come to Jesus? Did you come to Jesus for salvation? But did you come out of a sincere humility and a a spirit-led belief? Because if so, then you're going to find it. If you come to Jesus and you don't think of him as the Lord as our Father in heaven, right? The decision is yours. But if we come to him thinking he's our genie in heaven, Oh, if I just rub my Bible and I say a few magic verses, then God will will, will lavish upon me all this worldliness. And believe me, there's so many preachers out there with fancy sneakers and watches and and lifestyles and cars. And you think to yourself, well, obviously it's true because look at that guy. And I'll tell you right now, there is a judgment coming. 
But if you come for salvation out of sincere humility and remorse for your sin, if you've heard that there is a judgment coming, because there is, and that there's one way out, but that one way certainly works, never fails, and it comes exclusively from one source. You don't have to wonder, do I have to go somewhere else to get a different kind of salvation? No, there's only one name given under heaven by which men must be saved. Have you come out of sincere humility and a spirit-led belief saying, Lord, I surrender all to you. And I know that I've been saved to serve. So how then can I serve in your kingdom? Lord, equip me through your Holy Spirit to labor toward the things which you have called me to which may even lead me into desperate situations, and yet I will trust in you because you've promised never to leave me or forsake me. You see, that's what a true believer, that's what a true believer can expect. But John 1 verse 12 says this, But as many as received him, he gave to them the right to become children of God, to those who believe In his name. You know, you could enter into salvation, even right now, by surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus. You could lead, I could lead you in a prayer where you confess your sin to God, believing that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin, believing that he has truly risen from the grave and he is alive today. And that he's offering that salvation to you if you would repent and surrender to his lordship. You know, I could lead you in that prayer now. As a matter of fact, I am going to lead that prayer now. And if you believe these things in your heart and you confess them with your mouth, the Bible says you shall be saved. Let's pray now. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. And I know that you are holy, and I fall short of your holiness. But I believe that Jesus is God made flesh. And when he died on the cross, his righteousness bought salvation for me. I believe that he has risen from the grave, that he is alive now and that he offers salvation to me, forgiveness of all my sin, that I would be kept by his hand forever if I would turn from my sin now and receive it. Lord, I'm turning from my sin now, and I surrender control of my life to you. Lord, come into my life now. Fill me with your presence Fill me with your Holy Spirit, whom you say will never leave me. And now begin to teach me how to live a life that pleases you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You say, I just prayed that prayer, Steve. And uh, I just prayed that prayer. And, um, you know, I, what do I do now? Well, here's what you do now. I'd love to hear from you. You can, uh, you can contact us at groundworksministries.com. Groundworksministries.com. And there's a way that you can reach out to us. You just say simply, hey, I prayed with you. Now what do I do next? If you need a Bible, we'll try to get you a Bible. If you need a church to go to, maybe we know people in your town. But, uh, but reach out to us. And then also, guys, share with your friends www.groundworksministries.com slash podcast and they can also watch this message. For the rest of you, hey, I'm Steve Wiggins and you have been listening to the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Once again, check us out at www.groundworksministries.com. Groundworks Ministries.